Ed. Um, I'd like to introduce you to Joe and Mayor McDonald. I've known Joe and Mayor McDonald for uh, almost 20 almost 20 years, but we really we really just um, developed a relationship maybe about 10 years ago, um, and we've been working very close together. I think they're one of the best in the business. If you go, if you I don't really promote workshops very often, but you do um, because that's not what I do. But if you I I, I, don't, I don't really give these type of endorsements. So if you ever looking to go on a workshop, I encourage you to go with Joe and Mayor McDonald. They're one of the best in the business. They care about their clients. They, um, it's, the, 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 the clients come first, they come second. And it's more about the personal service, the personal touch and that type of thing. So um, so with that being said, I think you guys are in for a really good treat. There will be specials after the program that will be sent out. I don't think I put Olympus in there, but um, but I will, anybody looking to upgrade Olympus, I'll offer 10% off all Olympus cameras and lenses. That's not include the 100, 400, that's not include the 100, 400 or the 150, 600. But sorry, I, I can't do that. I wish I could, but. I would get killed by people that are already ordered from me. Um, but, um, but with that being said, um, Joe and Mary, it's all yours. You can take it over. Uh, well, thank you, Gary. And, and thank you, Ellen and Roman and everybody in New Jersey for inviting us to speak today. Um, because we are vaccinated and I strongly urge everybody to, we are on our first trip in 14 months and we are in Arizona. And we're at our good friend, Cindy Markle's house up outside Phoenix because she has fast internet. If we were still at home in Hood Hollow, we found out we lost electricity yesterday or last night due to power outages and those storms. So I'm glad we're in Arizona right now. But in saying that, um, we have worked with Gary quite a bit in the past, you know, and we are now working with him with, he's mentoring some great young photographers and we are helping with that. And it's such an honor and pleasure to do that. But we still love our photography. We love what we're doing. We love to teach it. And we're excited to give this, and Joe will be giving the main program on macro, because even in the pandemic, I mean, we love being at home and exploring our own house. <laughs> Quit it. It's my turn to talk. Anyways, but, um, <laughs> but with macro, I mean, you can do it right in your backyard. So with that, it is my honor to introduce my husband, Joe McDonald. So let, me, let me just chime in here for a second, everybody. Please just put your questions in the chat. I'm going to be staying throughout monitoring it. I'm going to try to give some semblance to the questions, not necessarily ask it right away. So whatever questions you have, put it in the chat, okay? So take it away, Joe. Okay, well, I will echo everything Mary just said. Thank you, Gary, for uh, helping getting this all organized and all of you folks in New Jersey for attending. Uh, we're going to be talking about macro photography. And my point on this is not to just give you a bunch of pretty pictures and give you a, a line of BS, basically. What I want to do here is really give you some, some real concrete facts that you can use for your macro photography. And uh, that's what we'll be doing. So I'm glad it will be a, uh, recorded. a recorded session because there will be some things that you might want to uh, review more than once. I'm not really heavy on gear in any real way, but uh, I think it's important to understand this stuff, and that's the objective here. So my technical guru will now get the program going for okay, me. Okay, I'm going to try to share screen, and once I do, Roman, make sure that I have it up and running. Hang on a second here. Okay. Okay. Sorry about that. Right there. Okay, meanwhile, back right, at the ranch. Right click. So uh, uh, when we think of macro, obviously we think about close-up photography. And we're gonna be addr addressing this in, in uh, several different avenues, if you will. Pardon me? Why? So when we get them home, I'll have to eat right away. I go out and uh, do some shit. Are we okay? Yeah, I just muted somebody. Okay. 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 So let's, let's kind of define macro photography right off the get-go. And that has a rather loose definition, you know, but uh, I like to think of it more in terms of like what half-life size or greater. But a lot of our macro subjects like monarch butterflies or frogs and things if you were at half size, they're still going to be bigger than the your your frame. So um, we might think really more realistically for macro photography. 
at like one fourth life size and greater. But the um, what I want to address right here is when you see that one colon two, if we think of that as a fraction, one over two or one half life size, one colon one is life size, one colon three would be one third life size. But if you had three colon one, it would be three times life, life size. And if you're, uh, if you purchased a macro lens or if you read some of the stuff, uh, I know some people have been a little bit confused just what these numbers mean or, or exactly how that goes. So what I'd like to address in the course of this is magnification, depth of field, flash, uh, a little bit on backgrounds, a little bit on uh, like pushing the envelope with advanced solutions, and then uh, some equipment. And, and basically, I'm not going to go much on equipment because the equipment itself, if you have the lenses, that's the gear. But there are a few other things that I'll show you that can really enhance that. If we're thinking about macro photography, typically the lenses are somewhere between 50 and 65, 95 to 105, 180 to 200, maybe even 180 to 250. And these lenses will have different advantages for us, which is what I'll be talking about. But um, you can also have close focusing telephotos that will certainly get you within the, say the one to four range. And this uh, Olympus lens, this 300 millimeter focuses so close that with a 2x converter on it, you are at 0.9 magnification. That's almost one to one. And we're talking about a distance of about 40 inches. So can you imagine that for working distance for things? It's really great. So as I said, you know, the, our different lenses here, but the, the points to that as to what you would want to use, if you're using a short lens, you have a wide angle of view. So you're going to have more in the background possible, and you're also going to be closer to your subject, the short working distance. That 90 to 105, a more restricted angle of view, your working distance is a little greater. But I often suggest having the longer focal length lens because we have a limited angle of view, which means we're going to have less depth or less background to it. And we also have greater working distance. And that's really important if you have skittish subjects. So I'll show you a diagram like this several times to kind of reinforce the point. But if we're using a long focal length lens and we're, we have a subject that is two inches wide, what I'm doing diagra diagrammatically here is indicating that you have a greater working distance with a long focal length than you do with the short focal length. And you can see how the spread of the, uh, the angle of view is that it's gonna be larger. And we'll talk about this a little bit more as we go along. So you can get the same image size. And what we're really talking about with macro photography is image size. You can get the same image size with a short lens as you can with a long lens, but you're gonna to have to be closer. And that in fact is why you might wanna use those longer lenses. And the closer you are, obviously, the greater chance it might disrupt your subject. Lighting can become more of an issue. Uh, sometimes you might have your lens hood or something actually shading your subject, and you certainly could maybe frighten something away. So the backgrounds will vary. And if you want a simple composition, the longer focal length lens is certainly the way to go. If you want to incorporate habitat or background, and there's really some great stuff you can do in that fashion, the shorter focal length lens would certainly be handy for that. So here's the uh, Olympus. 30 millimeter, so it's the equivalent of a 60 millimeter on a full frame DSLR. And I have a pretty broad uh, angle of view here, but this is also addressing something that I'll talk about later in the program, but I will wait till then. So if you have a flip out uh, monitor on your camera, use it because that will allow you and get you in the habit of using that camera at a low angle that you don't have to kill yourself. So I'm shooting this uh, green frog in our pond at Hoot Hollow at eye level, or almost eye level for the frog, but I don't have to be burying my chin in the ground there. You can see my eyepiece, how dirty it is. That's from uh, when Mary was using it, I'm sorry. So uh, <laughs> Not anyway. true. Yeah, look at that, it's filthy. Okay, 
So if we have two lenses that are at the same working distance, and what I mean by that is like we're 12 inches away or 15 inches away, whatever, the image size will differ and the backgrounds will be different as well. So uh, working distance makes such a such a important point, if you will, for our composition. So I'm illustrating this with, again, my 7 to 14 millimeter uh, wide angle. And I'm very close to these trout lilies. This was at our house just a, a few weeks ago. And what I'm going to do here, just diagrammatically, it's not quite accurate, is act as if I was using a, say, like 100 millimeter lens instead of a, uh, a 14 millimeter lens. And now what I'll have would be something like that. Now, in reality, though, the background would be blurred out. You wouldn't have that same kind of uh, sense of apparent sharpness with a 100 millimeter or 200 millimeter. And I'll show you that with this next shot. This is uh, just a detail of a hepatica. You can see those little hairs that uh, are kind of a insulator because these things come out early in the spring and the temperature can drop. But you can no you notice there that there's virtually no distinguishable background. Whereas this shot with a seven millimeter again, shows habitat, shows where this critter was, or this critter, this plant was photographed. And again, this was using one of the uh, features with Olympus that made this depth of field completely possible. I much prefer a shot like this today that gives context to a, uh, a scene than I do something like that that just isolates the subject. So when we're talking about the uh, lenses, and this I've always found really annoying when you looked at specifications for, for buying lenses, especially macro lenses, they would give the minimum focus distance, but that's based upon the sensor's position or back in the day, the film plane. So if you had a 180 millimeter lens, for example, the working, the minimum focus may have been nine, 19 inches, but in fact, you were about nine and a half inches away. You might be comfortable at 19 inches from this rattlesnake, you'd be crazy, but you certainly won't be comfortable at it at nine and a half inches. So if we have approximately the same uh, image size, and in this case, I'm a little rough on that, but um, I'm sorry, if I, if I have the same working distance, I have my 60 millimeter at 19 inches, and I have my, uh, it was a 40 to 150 with a 1.4 converter on it. So it became a 420 millimeter lens, the equivalent of really 840, wasn't it? Yeah, 420. Yeah. 420. Because it was 150 to 300. Yeah, yeah, but 420 becomes 840. Yeah. Uh, oh, okay, never mind. Anyways, we're 19 inches away, and what do I know? <laughs> so uh, you can see, though, that at 19 inches, I have a considerable difference in my image size. And uh, I, if I needed to do something tight, like the SD card, I could do that at 19 inches. I'd have to get a lot closer with that 60 millimeter macro. Here with the uh, 30 millimeter, and this, again, if we were talking about a full frame camera, this would be 60 millimeter and the other would be 840 at this point. We have uh, uh, at seven and a half inches or at 40 inches and approximately the same image size. A little bit, I, I should have backed off to about 45 inches or so to really make it about the same. Now, I wanted to show you using, and, and I would so much recommend for folks that are like learning how to use their lenses to do something as a, a 210, yes, 420, yes, you're right, Mary. Mary was right, I was wrong. Um, with a little test like this that gives you an idea of what your gear is going to be capable of doing in a non-stressful environment. If you were trying to do this with a, a, a living turtle out in the field, you'd be so concerned with composition and exposure and keeping the critter within the lens, you don't learn anything. So here I am, my seven to 14 millimeter the front element is one and a half inches from 
that, that actually at this point, the, uh, the ruler, because I couldn't bring it any closer without bumping the, uh, the turtle. And the two shots there, one is shot wide open and the other one is at F-22. So you see the great depth of field that I'm getting. Now let's go to the 30 millimeter equivalent of a 60. And again, now my working distance is seven and a half inches, but I don't have that wide, wide angle view. I'm already beginning to isolate the subject. In the background, even at F-22 is a little bit diffused. It's, or uh, what would you say, uh, out of focus, a little mm -hmm. bokeh effect, if you will. The 60 millimeter is now, uh, again, 14 inches away. So I have a much, much more comfortable working distance, if you will. And then if we go up to the, uh, uh, what would be the, actually a focal length of 210 millimeter, but it, with the Olympus, it becomes a 420. I'm 40 inches away and there I am wide open and also at F-22. And even at F-22, you see that I don't have the depth of field carrying to the background, but I do have depth of field that is basically covering the whole turtle. So as our working distance increases, or, or I should say our working distance does increase with our greater focal length and our backgrounds decrease. And if we think of that in compositional terms, we can certainly simplify our backgrounds then by using the longer lenses. And if we want to incorporate background, don't use those long lenses. So with a, a full frame camera, that 50 to 65 millimeter, the working distance about two and a half to three inches with the approximately 100 millimeter, it's six inches and nine and a half for say uh, the 200 millimeter. And this would be at one to one life size on the sensor. And it was a lot easier for, actually when we project onto a, or you know, pop this up on a screen, we're seeing something far greater than one to one at that point. But where this, is, this comes about, if you're not familiar, is if we had a, a a slide and we took a picture of a penny at one to one and we had our slide which would represent you know the the uh, an unmagnified view you could lay the penny on that slide and it would cover the penny exactly on the transparency with a sensor and, and when you project obviously that's all off the board but that's where we're getting these ratios if you will now there is several, I use a really right stuff focusing rail like this, but uh, there's a couple far cheaper examples of that that probably aren't as well built. But if you need to move forward or backwards or left, excuse me, left to right to just fine tune a macro subject, it's a lot easier to do with a focusing rail than it is trying to move a whole tripod back and forth. If you're using flash, you may not even use a tripod or need one. But if you're doing ambient light stuff, it's generally very important to have a tripod so you have a very firm support. So our other macro options, we have close focusing telephotos, telephotos with teleconverters, and lenses like 70 to 200 or 100 to 400 with teleconverters and or extension tubes. And when we get into that part, um, this is something you may want to review again later on. But what I'm showing right now is an old lens chart when I think they still publish those kind of things from a 100 millimeter Nikon uh, macro lens. And at F2.8, when I only had a half life size, not life size, but half life size, my depth of field at F2.8 was about 1 16th of an inch. And all the way at F32, it was only one half inch. And I have a little sea turtle popping up there. How much would 1 16th cover on that turtle? Probably not even its eye. And even at a half inch, you'd only have maybe the head of that turtle in focus. So when you're close, you don't have much depth of field. But one of the things I'm gonna talk about, the gem, I think, of this whole thing I'll be talking about it a little bit later. That's kind of like the key to this. And uh, well, stay tuned. So short lenses always provide the greater depth of field at any f-stop, but your depth of field or your image size is gonna be smaller 
as I said before, your image size is going to be identical with short lenses or long lenses, but at, at the same work or the, the same image size. The same image size, but your depth will and your depth will be almost the same, but your working distance will be different. Thank you, Marianne, because I'm talking faster than I'm thinking, but she'll tell you I do that a lot. Okay. So image sizes with telephotos. And remember, we're going to use the same kind of concept when we're talking about telephoto with macro. Your depth of field decreases the longer your focal length lens is. Your angle of view decreases. Your distances between objects become compressed. And we don't see that too much in macro photography. But you do if, you had a, uh, if you're using a telephoto at normal working ranges. Uh, I think of, I use an example of like a a, a camera in the backfield of a uh, baseball game, and it looks like the second baseman, the pitcher, the catcher, and the umpire and the batter are all stacked up because of this compression. And then the other thing with increased image size, and this goes for macro lenses or works for telephotos or telephotos being used as macro lenses, camera or subject movement becomes far more noticeable. And that can really be an issue. Now, the point with a, uh, a crop factor camera is that if you're at the same working distance, so let's say you're four feet away from something, your image size is going to look bigger on a crop factor camera than it will on a full frame camera. And it's not the camera that's, well, it's the, the sensor that's doing that. It's not the magnification. So actually, the magnification depth of field that you have at a given working distance is the same. The depth of field is the same. But if we change the working distance, the depth of field is going to change. And we'll I'll illustrate in that in just a moment. So for example, I'm using the, uh, the 300 millimeter Olympus, which is the equivalent of a 600 millimeter because of the smaller image size. So although I'm hand holding this 300, it's like a 600. And I'd like you to appreciate the depth of field in that shot, truly, because this was shot with my camera resting on my knee on a kayak, but I was using focus stacking or focus bracketing which shot 15 frames and then put them together into one composite that you see there with a heck of a lot of depth of field. But we'll address this kind of thing a little bit later. The advantages of telephotos for macro work is working distance, as I just illustrated with the little turtle before, 40 inches instead of like seven and a half inches. And if uh, our working distance is the same, just repeating what I've said before, but trying to hammer this point home. Our image size can be approximately the same, but our depth of field or our, our uh, backgrounds are going to differ considerably because of the narrow angle of view. The working distance will be different. The, the image size will be the same. The, the working distance will be different. Yes. Say I, that again. Okay. The working distance will be dif different, 40 inches versus seven and a half but the image size will be the same. The same. This is why Mary is always next to me. <laughs> slow down. Okay, slow down, Joe. So this was, uh, I think Jack and Ellen, you'll recognize a shot like this. I think we shot it together on the, on the uh, uh, last summer, but it illustrates the point of using a longer lens that will give you close focusing because this is a water strider and then a, uh, uh, what we were attracted to in these shots was the almost the, the UFO kind of look of the reflection or the, uh, the light Shadow. shadows from the dimpling on the surface from those water striders that were across this, a uh, quiet stream. So you could get the same image size with a full frame sensor as you will with your crop factor if you simply crop in your image after the fact. And that's certainly one of the great reasons for having a, uh, uh, like a full frame camera that has a lot of megapixels because of the ability to crop in and still keep your detail. But if you're, let me read this so I don't talk over my head. If you are obtaining the same image size using either a full frame or a crop factor, uh -huh. 
you'll have greater depth of field with the crop factor because your working distance is greater. The actual image size is dictated by the lens or as far as magnification. But if you want to have the same image size that you would get with either one, you have to back off with the crop factor camera. And the further away you are, focal length wise, your image size decreases. As your image size decreases, your depth of field increases. And I will hammer this point home in just a few minutes that will really illustrate that point. So here's a, a full frame camera and I have it at a, it, it doesn't matter the magnification, it was one third uh, magnification there, but I'm with my full frame camera, I'm 22 inches away from that tiger. And then I have that little red circle, this is on the left hand side, and you can see the, uh, the stripe that I'm circling. Now I'm at 22 inches with the crop factor camera as well. And you can see I have a much bigger image size there. But if you look at the two stripes, you compare the two, they're essentially the same because I, the lens at 22 inches dictates the depth of field, not the, uh, well, it's the lens that does that. So, as image size increases, this is a mantra that Mary and I always teach in our workshops. As image size increases, depth of field decreases. As image size decreases, depth of field increases. So if we back up to get a smaller image size, we will increase our depth of field. And that is so counterintuitive when you're thinking of macro photography because we usually think of coming in real close and getting a big image size. But when we do that, we are going to decrease our depth of field. So look at this. I have a full frame camera at 22 inches and I have the 1.6 crop factor camera at 35 inches. And my little red arrow is pointing to the, uh, the grid. I think it was from a, a screen cage or something. And you can see the noticeable degree of sharpness that's in the, uh, the crop factor camera, because in fact, the lens was much farther away, yet the image size was identical, but it's because of the crop factor on that. So backing up to 35 inches with that crop factor camera, I had greater depth of field, as I would if I backed up my full frame camera to 35 inches and cropped in. So Full frame camera at 60 inches at F11, you see that there's not very much depth of field, but at F32 at 60 inches, where the, the tiger, the little toy tiger was a lot smaller in the frame, but I've cropped it so that it was now approximately the same size as the, the shot that I did back here with that 22 inches. You know, what have I done? I like three times. But look at how the depth of field has certainly increased. So if you have a sensor that allows you to do so, backing off, do so what? To, to back off and then and crop, to crop and to crop. Thank you, Mary. As if you have a sensor that lets, lets you do that and you can listen to Mary, you will have much greater depth of field. So if my lens to subject distance was 22 inches and I'm at F32, look at the relative uh, lack of sharpness where I'm circling it on the image on the left, I think it's on the left for you guys, and at 60 inches, how much more definition is visible at that same F32. So it, as our image size decreases, depth of field increases, and cropping maximizes that depth of field. So here's an example of a, uh, I didn't shoot that this year, but I hope to do something similar to this. Uh, a desert wolf spider, one nasty looking critter, and although the depth is carrying through the uh, pedipalps in the foreground and the eyes, you know you see that the legs are basically completely out of focus, but there's a little bit more definition here, not much in backing off and having a smaller image size here, where with a smaller image size, my depth of field is increasing. So I'm illustrating this graphically for you, where with the, the same aperture, I might only cover a small portion of that frog, 
But if I back off, in this case, I move the frog farther away, the depth of field spreads and gets larger. Now, because we're shooting Olympus now, this whole thing with extension tubes and teleconverters no longer applies to us because these lenses focus so freaking close. However, if you have lenses that, um, you know, like the older 70 to 200s or 300 millimeters or whatever, you may want to use an extension tube to increase your magnification because what it's going to do is extend your minimum focus. It, it decreases your working it, distance. And it decreases your working distance, as Mary just said. So how this works, how you can uh, uh, know what your magnification ratios will be is the extension tube goes over your prime lens in a fractional sense. And in this case, I, I'm showing three different half-life size combinations, 12 over 24, 24 being the millimeter of your lens, a 25 millimeter tube or over a 50, or a 100 millimeter over a 200. Any of those combos will give you half-life size. But I can tell you the one that was with the 12 to 24, your lens would, your lens element would almost be touching the subject. Whereas with the 100 over the 200, you might be nine inches away or, or there around. So again, if we wanted full magnification, 24 over 24 or 200 over 200. Now that would be with a lens that doesn't already have the uh, macro capabilities to it. So we're, this is more of a theoretical exercise here, but it gives you an idea of, of exactly how magnification works. So it's obviously much more practical to use longer lenses, although you might need a little bit more extension, but your working distance won't be as close as it would be with the uh, short lenses. And where people run into real problems, I've seen this a lot of times on workshops, is when they've used extension tubes on zoom lenses. And all of a sudden they can't focus for some reason, but we'll explain why in just a second. So let's consider a 70 to 200 millimeter, which I used to think was just a wonderful lens if you didn't have a macro lens along to be able to do macro work. Now remember, magnification ratio, which is the reproduction ratio, if you will, is the length of your extension tube over the length of the lens you're using. Now, a zoom lens has a variety of primes. It has 70 and all the way up to 200. So if we have the, uh, a 50 millimeter tube over the lens when it's zoomed to 200, we have a reproduction ratio of one to four, quarter life size. If we zoom to 50 over 100, it's now half life size. And if you zoom it out, so it's at 70 millimeter, your magnification ratio is less than one half. It's cl getting close to one to one. But when you're using it there, you will be about two inches away from your subject, a very impractical range. Now, you can also increase your magnification ratio by using a teleconverter. And how you do that though, if you're using extension tubes, it really dictates the order in which you do so. So let's look at this again with uh, using a 200, 170, the 70 to 200 millimeter with a 50 millimeters of, of tube. Normally we'd have one quarter or one half or almost life size. But if we then put the teleconverter behind this whole combination, we're now 2xing this magnification ratio. So we're getting half life size, life size, and even greater than life size. But it depends on this order, as you'll see in just a second. So how we stack these up is important. All right, I've already said that, so I'll get around it. But here's our, our little diagram. We have the 70 to 200 millimeter, and we have it zoomed to 200 millimeter, and I have a 2X converter I can put on and a 50 millimeter tube. I'm gonna put all these between the lens and the camera, by the way. So if I do the 50 right behind the lens, I now have 50 over the prime lens, which is 200, and I have one quarter. Now 
Multiplying that by 2x, I'm getting half-life size, which I'm doing right here. If instead I have the converter behind the 200, and now I have 50 over 400, I'm at one eighth life size. So I'm really not gaining anything. I'm probably better off with the uh, without the teleconverter at all. So how you want to do this, if you are using extension tubes with a converter, and this would work with a 1.4 converter and give you better optical quality, but the math would have been a little bit more confusing for me, as you've already seen with what Mary's corrected me on a couple times, quite deservedly so, by the way. So when we're using extension tubes, if you need, if your if your system still needs extension tubes, you can you can buy. I don't know if Nikon still makes them or not, but I think Kenco did and Canon had them, and other off brands might. And you might be able to get a set that's like has three tubes of 12, 25, 36, or even maybe buy a 50 millimeter tube. But when you put those tubes on, it's extending your minimum focus, but it's also cutting back on your back focus, on how far away you can focus. So for example, if we have a, our lens would normally go from infinity to 10 feet, let's say it's a 300 or 400 millimeter lens, we put a 12 millimeter tube on, you might be able to focus to almost infinity, to 100 feet and extend your focusing to about seven feet. As opposed to if you put the 50 millimeter tube on, and I, I just ballpark these uh, numbers, and they may not be exact, but your, your furthest distance might be 25 feet away, but you could then focus to about three feet away. What I always recommend people do is to use the shortest, the smallest extension tube that you can get away with using. Because if you find that you suddenly have a subject that's farther away, you might not be able to focus on it because your, your focus and extension has cut it. Okay, Mary's telling me to get closer. So, okay, we're good. <laughs> Now, if you have a zoom lens, you can have an extremely short working distance if you're using those short focal lengths. And I would recommend that you use those extension tubes more towards like the 100 to 200 millimeter range if you're using the 70 to 200, because then your working range actually will work for you. But I said people will sometimes have a problem with this, and here's why. When you're at 70 millimeter, and again, this is diagrammatically showing what's going on here, my working distance is really close. When I'm at 200, my working distance is much farther away. Now, if you didn't know this, you might have your 70 millimeter zoomed in, but be at the position where I have the 200 millimeter right now, and you can't get the darn thing in focus. Or, you had previously shot at 70 millimeter and everything was nice and fine, and, but you were really close. And then you thought, oh, I'm gonna zoom in for a bigger image. And suddenly you can't get it in focus because you actually have to back off now because of the different ratio we have here in that magnification ratio. And believe me, I've seen a lot of people who have tried using extension tubes with zoom lenses. And it's like, man, it used to work. I can't get it to work now. It's because of this principle. So I think if I told you two gems so far, one would be about cropping and moving back, like I just said, so you increase your depth of field. And the other is if you're using this to be really cognizant of the fact that as you zoom to a longer focal length, you have to back off to get your subject in focus. So that being said, we can have a, the same image size with a longer macro versus a shorter, but we have to change our working distance. I'm just hammering this point home because it's such an important point. The longer one is going to give us that long or the more uh, narrow angle of view as opposed to being really close and having a wide angle of view. Our, uh, working distance increases with that greater focal length and our backgrounds decrease. So if we wanna have simplified backgrounds, go with the longer lens. And 
how much is going to vary. So if you want a simple composition, use that long lens. But uh, if you want to incorporate habitat, then use the shorter lens. And uh, Olympus only goes down, well, Olympus is the equivalent of a 60 millimeter with that 30 millimeter lens. But uh, here's an example using a the uh, Olympus lens with, I think, uh, I think that was the 12 to uh, 100 to be a 24 millimeter. And I have a broad angle of view, but my, my nearest coral fungus here is probably about nine inches away from the camera. And here again is where I used focus stacking, which we'll talk about a little bit later. So if our two lenses are at the same size, same your distance. Same, same distance, your image size is going to differ radically and your backgrounds will be different as well because of the narrow angle of view. So I, I just shot this wood turtle just a couple of weeks ago. This is the stream behind our house. And this was shot with that seven to 14 millimeter. So it was the equivalent of a 14 millimeter here. And technically, if we're talking about macro being half life size or, or, or smaller or greater, uh, this is not macro, but certainly it's a nice close up. And at seven millimeter, I have habitat. And I, I so much prefer these kind of shots now over just uh, frame filling you know, turtle pictures that don't really tell you anything about what you have. Now, here's another example. And this was shot with a, uh, I think a 20 millimeter lens, maybe a 14 millimeter lens. The front, those ferns in the foreground or whatever those uh, palm-like things are, were actually touching the lens hood for this shot with the uh, like 14 millimeter lens. And then from that same distance, all I did was change lenses. I now had a 200 millimeter on and you can see where my arrow is pointing to what was now in my field of view. So at the same working distance, I have a completely different image. And uh, uh, what do you want to convey? Wh whichever it is, it's uh, quite dependent upon the lens itself. So here's our same working distance, two different lenses, two different angles of view, and obviously two different magnifications. And I'm diagrammatically showing that as well. So uh, briefly on flash, the, the deal and here, uh, before I get into that, another nice thing about, um, if you can back off and achieve depth of field, you may be able to use a wider aperture like F11 versus F16 or 22, where your aperture size becomes so small that diffraction can become an issue, that the light goes into lens and, and bends and it just actually softens the image. But we can enhance sharpness to an extent and also increase our depth of field dramatically when we are using flashes. And when I was using Canon lenses, I was using, this is my favorite macro rig. Uh, it was using the twin flash system. And I, I, I almost always use it this way, but I think there was a, a focusing or a, a lens mount for it too that you put them right onto the, the lens barrel as well for more directional light. And this was shot with my Olympus camera with my Canon uh, five to one macro lens that still with an adapter worked on that. Um, and I didn't have aperture choice, but uh, it gave me a super huge image of that jumping spider. Now, I'm not a huge fan of black backgrounds for net or for uh, subjects that are out during the day. Now, obviously, you can see there's a, 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 a sky background here, but that spider is in the shade. It's darker. And you can see there's blur there because of the slow shutter speed. When I used the flash, it froze the, the, uh, the spider, but that's not shadow behind it. That's a ghost image of the spider because when I shot it, the spider kind of moves back and forth and it spent more time in that shadowed position there, which was actually its body against the uh, ambient light background. So ambient light and ghosting can become an issue. 
And sometimes you might have to do a compromise that your background isn't as bright as you want it to be, that you might have to underexpose it to an extent so that ghosting doesn't seem to occur. It might even be there, but it's hidden by that dark background. And this is where digital really shines because you can shoot as many shots as you need and do trial and error and maybe eventually get that ambient light background perfect and also have a spider that's not moving at that particular time. Back in film days, this would be kind of a, you know, a crapshoot whether you're, we're gonna get it or not. So we have a black background there and I cheated. I didn't have a, an example to show you right off the get-go here of a mantis with a, a flash shot that was also an ambient light background. That was actually an all natural light shot, but it also illustrates something else that I'll be mentioning and that is using re reflectors to bounce light back in. So it still is relevant. Now, one flash alone can create a flash look. And sometimes that, that can be fine. It might be all you have. But the images can look flat. And uh, that's where I find those twin flashes are really, really handy. Here's uh, uh, one flash on the spider on the left. And the second one, I used two flashes, but the second flash wasn't even with the twin flash system. It was with a flash that had a, uh, probably a Fotex transmitter receiver system where I had a flash held behind the spider. Mary was holding that. And when I fired the, the camera, the first flash fired and it triggered the other flash, which then gave me this, this kind of like high key backlit effect. And two flashes really can give you enormous amount of creativity there. So again, here's the, uh, the rig for that. And the points I wanted to show on this is, well, here's the Olympus one. And uh, this rig here weighs virtually nothing. It's, uh, I, I love it, it's, I'm using it all the time. But what I wanted to show you there was something that Wimberly makes and that's the uh, a module one and a module three. It's their, their macro bracket. And, and Wimberly also makes a little hot shoe adapter. I have the old Strobe frame on, but the Wimberly one works really, really well. And each of these, if you can you know, see how there's like a flange to uh, adjust the ball and socket, it's infinitely variable. It's as variable as your, home, your own elbow, shoulder, wrist joint for being able to move things about. And then, although the, uh, the top of that is one quarter 20 screw, to make this quick and easy to put on, I'd suggest buying the, the Wimberly module that fits on top that gives you a quick clamp. As I said here, I think this was the Strobe frame that makes this as well, but uh, Wimberly makes a really, really nice one there. And then I don't know if Really Right Stuff still makes this, but they used to make a, uh, a, a, like a ring flash system that you can see your lens would, uh, if it had a long lens plate, could fit underneath the ring, clamp on, and then you had adjustments. And this, these, uh, these two brackets, if you will, can slide back and forth. They, uh, they had almost a over a 180 degree curvature, if you will, for lighting. And where this is really important then is how you can control your light. Like here for a leaf cutter ants, I had two flashes going, one in the foreground, and I held the other one behind the, the, um, behind the, the ant and created that backlit effect. Thank you, Marianne, she's, she's my coach here. Um, Nikon's macro system, although it was heavy, was also wireless at that point and was pretty darn good in that sense. I really liked what they had there. But you can do the same thing with Fotex um, transmitters and receivers with any flash you have. And uh, by the way, if, if, if you all switch to Olympus after this program, keep your Canon or Nikon flashes because they will still interface with your Olympus system, just not on TTL. So here's another example of your uh, leaf cutter ant. But the background there isn't black because I have behind it a background. And it may have been just a, a green photo uh, that I, a, a photograph that was out of focus foliage or a gray card or something. 
But one flash was directed at the background and another flash was directed on the subject, maybe even two flashes on that. And again, if you're using these Fotex transmitters and receivers, you can have any number of them there. And then it's just more a matter of how many people you can have holding the flashes for you or uh, how many brackets you have. And then if you really want to soften the light to an extent, uh, I'm using these uh, Rogue, the company is Rogue, R-O-G-U-E, flash benders and reflectors. And, and they really help diffuse the light to soften the light that you don't have these harsh shadows to it. And, uh, they're not very expensive and they work very, very well. And they pack well as well. Now, I wanna get back to this thing about our depth of field where we had F2.8 or F32 and you still don't have a lot of depth of field. So a couple of ways we can get around that. Normally our depth of field, you know, runs parallel with our digital plane or our film plane. But if we change our aperture, we're gonna increase that, but we're still in that plane. And if you have a tilt and shift lens, you can actually, because of the, I don't know if I can pronounce that right, Schlingfug principle. And if you wanna impress people, learn the pronunciation of that and just throw it out offhandedly at times. But when you use that, what will happen is your lens will tilt and it changes the dynamics of the, the depth of field to actually cover your subject. Um, I have two of these. I'm happy to sell them because it's extra gear. They're expensive and there's only a minimal amount of focal length options. And virtually everybody I know that has these tilt and shift lenses have them as used lenses because everybody just keeps selling them. So here's an example though with hedgehog cactus with, uh, you can see the depth of field, the needles on the uh, left-hand side of my screen are soft, but with the tilt and shift, I have it sharp because of the increased depth of field at the same aperture size. But sometimes regardless of the depth of field, you can't cover the whole subject. If you go down to F16 or 22 or 32, you're gonna have some degradation of your uh, sharpness simply due to uh, diffraction. And uh, do we have a moderate? It would be funny if we're nobody, well, we haven't had any questions. So and if, if make sure we're, we're still on, are we still on? Are we on? Anybody give feedback? Yeah, you're still on. One was about gear, and I figured we could leave that towards the end, and you're talking about it too. Okay. So okay. I was just thinking, can you imagine if somehow we lost the connection? <laughs> this whole thing and i'm so i'm so with it that i'm almost completely done the program when i realized that maybe it's wise to do a check so <laughs> welcome to my world so how can we get the whole subject sharp look at look at the difference there you know we if we're focusing on the front or the back end we're not getting the whole thing in sharp by any means but here we do with two very happy species of uh leafhopper and how we can do that is by shooting a series of frames and then a varying focal lengths, or not focal lengths, but focusing points, and then putting, putting them together either with the helicone focus, which I did here. Look at the difference here. Or you can do it in Photoshop uh, by using layers and masks. Or you can also, well, you can also do this kind of shooting where you're using a focusing rail system like I'm using here with the uh, Cognosys system. And the advantage of this over refocusing is that when you do it this way, the, the mechanics of the optics are different and more accurate than when you're actually changing focus. But whether it's really that important the point for the cost involved and how often you use it, I don't know. So we have Helicon Focus, Zreen Stacker, Photoshop Photo Merge, and these will all put images together, uh, uh, basically software-wise. Or if you're using Olympus, you can also do that with what is called in-camera, it's in-camera bracket, and then it's focus is the, uh, is the menu. And it is a nifty, nifty feature. 
And it's easy to understand when you buy my very inexpensive ebook that covers this whole thing. But let me point this out to you because here I'm showing F4 with what's called a focus differential of 10, meaning that there's gonna be a, a, a big leap between the different focuses. And this is 15 shots. And this is the final image here. But you can see that there's obvious gaps in the focusing because the lens kept on doing these large focus differential gaps here. And make sure they know this is with Olympus. And this is with Olympus. And basically you'd have the same kind of thing if you did manual, uh, like a Zreen stacker type of thing, that if you made a, a big gap between each focusing point and you put them together, you might have big spaces in between. So here you can see it very clearly, even though I had 15 shots, it extended way beyond what my magnification or my, my image size was. So it was a waste of time here at F4. And with the Olympus, you can only go up to 15 shots if you do this manually. If you do it automatically, you can get 900 or 999 or maybe even 999. I don't have time for that. But here I only have three shots and I still have that focus differential of 10 but my depth of field at F22 overlaps sufficiently that I really don't have a gap between those shots, even though only three images instead of 15 were made for that particular thing. So that's how when I started the program and I showed that 30 millimeter macro with the marsh or with the marshmallow with the mushrooms, and you have that incredible depth of field here, it was with focus stacking. And I, and how this works with Olympus, and this is a very important point if you use it. If you use the in-camera aspect of it, you have to focus in what's approximately the middle position because it focuses, if you're shooting 15 shots, seven in front of that point and seven behind. But the first shot will be right on the point of focus. And as a funny aside, we were up in a... Uh, and a wonderful arboretum here in Arizona. And stupidly, because I had just shot a lizard with focus stacking, I still had that on and I'm using my 150 to 400. So I had range and a zone tail hawk flies really close to us. We miss it, flies back again and I shoot a shot. And the first shot is in focus because it was the shot, but then I have 15 shots of this progressively out of focus because I'm using focus bracket. And Mary's laughing. It was hurtful. But if you use manual, if, it starts about Yeah, hard. and if you're using manual and then you use the rain stacker or helicone focus or Photoshop photo merge, it starts at the beginning and then it stacks backwards. And why the heck they didn't put that in the software aspect Olympus. of it in Olympus, I don't know. This in 2019 was probably my favorite shot of the whole year. It's a robber fly shot with the 300 millimeter with the 2X converter on it with focus stacking. So I have this beautiful soft out of focus background and I have depth of field like you could not get. You could never get this at life size with a, a living insect because you'd have to be so close. But with that combo, which gave me 0.9 magnification and focus stacking, and I focused like right behind the eye so that it went behind to the abdomen and up front. I was just blown away by that shot. Two other points then. Things like this, you really have to have fast autofocus. That's a joke. What you need here is electronic flash to, to freeze the action. And how that's most easily accomplished if you're trying to get diurnal insects is with this rig called uh, the insect rig by Cognosis. And what it does, you can see those tubes on the left-hand side and on, on the bottom, those are lasers and where the laser intersects, the two laser beams, where they cross, that's where you focus. And when something breaks the beam there, your flashes fire and freeze the action. 
you know, some people actually wear this with a harness and go chasing after bugs. Good luck with that. It weighs a lot. And I've never had any luck. But by having a, like a, a sugar feeder where honeybees or moths or a night with a, uh, an infrared light or a UV light, I've had insects flying in randomly and nothing happens until the beam is broken. And then boom, you're getting things like that or like this with a cicada. And all of this, of course, is explained in my e-junkie ebook on high-speed flash and triggering devices. Now, one other kind of cool thing you can do if you're down in the desert southwest, and we didn't bring a UV light with us, maybe we'll buy one at a hardware store, is with a UV light, scorpions will glow fluorescent like this. And it's a, it's a really neat party trick if you're in Arizona at a picnic outdoors, and you start shining one of these around on the grounds, and suddenly people see scorpions all around them on, on, the, on the stones that never thought they were there. It's a good way to become popular at parties. Now, last thing I wanted to cover here, I think, is lightning bugs or fireflies. Um, and actually, it's a bioluminescent beetle. But what I'm showing right here is a shot with a traditional camera where I light painted the cattails and then let the exposure go and hope to get fireflies flying about. Now, for this, because I wouldn't see the results really until after the exposure is done, you're, you're painting and kind of like guessing that you might have to shoot several frames. Olympus has this knockout feature called live composite. And what that does is it only registers new light after the original exposure was made. So <laughs> imagine this stream at our house in, as dusk occurs. So I'm shooting this at maybe a, a one second exposure at, a, at F4. Well, that's the exposure. And as dusk continues, it's just gonna get darker and darker. And as it gets darker and darker, fireflies start coming out. And I can keep this camera on for as long as three hours to record this lightning bug spectacle. But the ambient light that was in there is never going to increase at night. It's only going to get darker, unless perhaps you had a really bright full moon, but I don't even think then. So all I'm going to get here is the background, and the, or the foreground, and then the fireflies itself. It's a super, super feature. And then briefly, uh, for macro work, especially a lot of that stuff might be like mushrooms or insects that are low to the ground. Uh, really right stuff makes a, a little tabletop tripod. They also make a ground pod. And then Rogue Safari makes these diffusers, as I talked about. Uh, flash diffusers, and also reflectors or diffusers that are really handy for adjusting your light. And I use their diffuser here on a bright sunny day to really soften the light on these hepatica. And then another, the only other tool that I, I regularly carry with me are these Wimberly plants. And they will hold up diffusers. They'll also, as you can see there, support a flower. You can use them in combination. And what you see there is what was called a, uh, there's a, a Wimberley uh, plant on a Wimberley uh, plant stake, which is basically, they have a um, screwdriver in the bottom of it that you pop out, stick in the ground. And uh, by the way, I, I just did a YouTube video that shows all this stuff going on, but it's a really, really uh, handy piece of uh, equipment. So, how about that for interrupting me for questions? That was great. Okay, I'm going to try to... Oh, wait, wait. wait, wait one wait, more thing. What? Oh. And that's our website. Uh, if yeah. you'd be interested in getting any of those books we just talked about, it'll be in your Zoom recording thing. And then I also have a lot of stuff on how we've shot things like the lightning bugs or uh, the plants and they're on our YouTube. Yeah, they're free and, YouTube. Yeah, and they're free YouTube things. That's subscribe yeah, to the channel. Put it in, the, you know, now that it's on the video... I know Ellen usually sends something out to everybody with the information, some of the stuff that we send out post meeting to them. Uh, 
So what macro lens so so lay? Uh, obviously, Joe talked about a lot of lenses, and now it's your decision based on probably budget, right? The shorter yeah. lenses for Canon are more affordable, uh, whether it's a Canon lens or some other third-party brand. Uh, and the longer lenses, the 180s of the world, the 200s, give you a better working distance. So, yeah, and I think uh, Sigma and Tamron both are making very high quality macro lenses that are a lot less expensive. Right. So uh, somebody here, Leanne, said, thank you for all the technical details. I love the understand what is going on under the hood so I can make better decisions. Uh, so again, you've got people there. Uh, anybody else have any other questions for Joe or Marianne? Yeah, I think, you know, the point I wanted to make there is once you have the lenses, you know, like macro should be a no brainer, but it really isn't because it's, it's your working distance and your depth of field and your angles of view that you really want to consider to make a good shot. And that's what I wanted to address here rather than like, well, okay, just come close. Right. Well, and I think you addressed something very, to me, important was that backing up these new cameras are so many megapixels now that by backing up and cropping you're helping your depth of field basically yeah it's absolutely and it, and that is a hard thing to break because for you know for most of the camera club people you know we're we we grew up with film and what you shot is what you got you know basically so we're we want to do macro, you come in close. And yet today, we don't have to do that. We can back off and get depth of field and even use smaller app or wider apertures so we don't even have a diffraction issue. Right. Joe, I have a quick question for you. Uh, is it better to use a teleconverter or just no glass and just have a smaller image and crop it on the computer? I would go if your uh, if your pixel size will uh, will allow, allow that. I would go that route. With okay. no converter. With no converter. Okay, great. Really enjoyed the program, guys. Nice seeing you. you. It's been thirty years, I think, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I haven't changed a bit. Now Mary has a little bit. But I really haven't. <laughs> All right. Thank you for the great presentations. Everything else. Ellen, you have anything else? Uh, you're going to send out the specials to everybody, right? And all I'm going to send good... out the specials. I'll send out the link uh, to the YouTube for anybody that uh, would like to watch the presentation again. And it'll also, both will also go to the people who were unable to tune in today, but had registered. And uh, Joe and Marianne, I'd like to... Uh, Thank you for the wonderful presentation. And I hope that everybody enjoyed it. Well, thank you, we, we, we enjoyed being here. And um, it's crazy that we're the whole way across the country since Pennsylvania and New Jersey are, are neighbors, but um, at least we had fast internet and it went off okay. Yeah, we, we, we had to go almost 2000 miles to get fast internet. <laughs> yeah. And it was the whole point of coming here. But uh, this is, I, I have to say, I don't know how many people like, you know, like are on Facebook or whatever. Mary challenged me this year to post a new picture taken that day for the whole year. And I would really recommend people do something like that because I know for myself that my photography has really, really grown because I've, I'm like pushing the envelope farther and farther on uh, just like never being lazy. It's like, man, I'm, if I do, it's like, did you take your picture today yet? I can get and, rid uh, of them. I can send them outside to take his picture. It's wonderful. So uh, it's been it's been really a good creative experience in that regard. You know that you, uh, and if you if you're uh, still working or something, you may only get weekends to do that. But but to do that kind of thing, I I would really strongly recommend. And for us, I have been so happy. That's where my tangent went from. I mean, I've been so happy at home shooting that I really, I could care less about traveling. You know, I, but here I am in Arizona and I'm so glad I'm in Arizona because we're killing things. We're getting such great stuff of new stuff. 
that it's like, I don't have to worry about my freaking downy woodpeckers for the next couple of weeks of getting a shot. But we are missing the spring migration to an extent. Yeah, I think we're going to miss our, our warblers coming through. Everything kind of leafed out early in Pennsylvania, and things are coming in early. But our, our friend today, Cindy, took us to a spot where we had frame filling least bitterns. Can you imagine that? And 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 avocets and, and black neck stilts. So, so we're happy. Leanne, yes, sure. Go ahead, ask another question. We got a little time. Hi. Um, I really, I really enjoyed the program. Um, Thank you. As I had said, um, I have a question. I recently did an inventory of the lenses that I have. And somewhat to my surprise, I found that a couple older lenses I had, I recently switched to Sony um, for mirrorless, but some of my older Canon lenses say macro on them. And I didn't know that I had macro lenses. And what is it that makes it macro? I'm close, still close, trying to yeah. digest a lot of the details you said, but. Yeah, yeah, actually, it, it's it's just that you can focus closer with it to make it more of a macro lens, but it really wasn't a macro lens. But it's just that you could focus closer. They they probably actually went in, and if you look at the lens barrel, it may actually have given like a one to three or or one to four, and uh, and that's as far as they generally went in that regard because right. they're just not built for anything farther on that or closer. So they they were really. You, you could very easily just say close focusing Mac or close focusing telephoto or close focusing zoom, but put the macro right. on it and you can pay more money for it. Yeah. I was wondering. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah. All right. If that's it, everybody, thank you, Joe and Marianne. It was great seeing you guys. I haven't seen you guys in a while. I'm like you, though. Yeah. I want to get out, Joe. I got to get on that airplane, you know? Well, I'll tell you what, it was It was very easy. We felt very safe. We wore our masks. You know, we're vaccinated. I really recommend you to get vaccinated, which will open up the world again to everybody. Um, you know, and then you can get out there and enjoy. And it's been wonderful. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm already past my second vaccine, so I'm a happy camper. So, yeah. Uh, yep. So for, for people that have been, like, following stuff on Facebook, we're going to be in southern Arizona then we're going to be in uh, Wichita Mountains for uh, burling owls and collared lizards and elk. And then we're going to be in White Creek, Arkansas for Mississippi kites and who knows what else. And then the Smokies for salamanders and, and elk. elk. So real quick, just quickly, because I don't think you really mentioned it that more. I know you showed Hood Hollow and they can go on. You have the place out in Pennsylvania, since most of our people here are from New Jersey, that you do run workshops at Hoot Hollow, right? Yeah. Yes. We, and also, we actually we have three workshops going this summer where we, we're only doing six people coming in. They'll stay at a farm vacation bed and breakfast down the road from us. They each have their own cabin, but we'll be doing our normal digital nature work, photo workshops. But we also run private shoots which is what Phil and Becky and Jack and Ellen are coming up to do. And they were there last year with us. So we are here and we are open for business and we're following COVID policy and, and it's good. And everything's hopping at Hoot Hollow, which is in central Pennsylvania, we're about an hour and 15 minutes west of Harrisburg. Okay. okay. Ellen, you got anything else there, everybody? Uh, that's it. Uh, hope everybody enjoyed the program. And again, uh, Joe and Marianne, thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. We enjoyed it. Thank you. Bye, everybody.